It's a Friday edition here on Zero Block 30, and today we have three rounds of the magazine. Round number one, Vietnam prisoners of war survived in part of their humor. We're going to be doing a lot of Vietnam talk. Honestly, it's mostly Vietnam talk today on the show. So we're going to talk about the prisoner of war. Because why? It's, it's the 50th, 50th anniversary. anniversary. Yeah, yeah. So of we're the, having a Not special... of the kickoff, um, but it is the 50th anniversary of the last combat troops coming home yes. from Vietnam. And that's when 500 and something POWs were released. Uh, round number two, the Vietnam toilet bomb. We're going to talk about that. Had you guys ever heard of it? Nope. I feel like tor tourists get that a lot, I'm sure. True. But... I, oh, I can't even imagine the amount of diarrhea I would have if I went to like a Southeast Asia country at this point. Just, mm. it would be brutal. Indonesia, yeah. any of those places, I'd be fucked. A lot Big of diarrhea. Fuck. Yeah, all right, round number three. It's been 50 years this week since the last combat troops in the Vietnam War came home. So one of those people is named Charlie Plum. He's a former captain in the Navy, and captain in the Navy was what rank? Oh, what, Kate? Oh, five? All right, oh, give it your... was is it, it five? No, thought... six. Six, yeah, yeah, six. Mm. Five is commander. So that's yeah. an O2, no, an O3 in the Marine Corps. Uh, that's yep. right. Good that's job, correct. Kate. Well hey. done. All right. E e e e e e six I don't in know the why Marine they wouldn't make it even across the board. I don't get it. When, when I got promoted to staff sergeant, I walked around the building, fly like an E6, like an E6, fly like an E6, like an E6. Anyways. Yeah, so we're going to have Charlie Plum on the show. He's going to talk about all the experiences. He was in Hanoi for six and a half years. I mean, when you, I've been at Barstool to get, put context. That's how long I've been at Barstool. Six and a half years. Bro, that's a long time. Think about that, man. Like the difference in my life at 34 years old and now 40 years old. These well, people are there seven six seven years yeah the mental toughness that takes is just absolutely like it's unimaginable it's crazy it is so. and when you i there were some tortured things that when i was preparing for the show i was like the that, that's a little rough to even talk about like to yeah, even put out on the internet and speak about it in this kind of format it's like i don't know if that's even appropriate yeah for the some torture of the and all the shit through. they went through crazy we'll yeah. get into it um, all right, let's get into it right now. We'll go to round one. What do we got, Kate? Today's show is brought to you by our good friends at Proper Wild. If you suffer from symptoms of ADHD like I do, which includes a lack of focus, no productivity, your brain is constantly wandering all around the joint, you need a little direction, my friends, you need to check out Proper Wild's clean all-day energy shot. Proper Wild uses organic caffeine stacked with L-theanine, which has been clinically shown to boost that energy, focus, productivity without all the jitters or the crash. There's no preservatives, no artificial sweeteners, no horrible chemicals, just a natural tasting energy shot with clean ingredients that work. I love it this weekend. My wife, he was out of town. It was me, the kids. We are playing a little bit of FIFA, actually, getting fifa on, and Cardi was going all over the place. I was going all over the place. We, I sat down and had a little proper wild, and I was ready to go for the next four or five matches. High energy level, high stakes. We were uh, Barcelona. Things were getting heated, but not as heated as they are when my heart starts warming up thanks to the old proper wild. Go to properwild.com slash Barcelona to try, prop, to try proper wild for 30% off. Today's show is also brought to you by our friends at Cross Country Mortgage. Buying a home can be one of the hardest things you can do. You need the best support available to get through it. That's why we're a big fan of Cross Country Mortgage. They're dedicated to getting you into your dream home and will stick with you in the trenches until it's done. Cross Country Mortgage has a team of loan officers dedicated to getting it done and finding you the best possible loan terms available. They have average close time of 21 days, which is ridiculously fast. They got a wide variety of loans, which means they have got everything to cover everyone. With huge variety of projects, they cover everything from renovations to refinances and everything in between. When you want someone you trust by your side every step of the home buying process, which is always, you need Cross Country Mortgage. They'll have your back from the beginning to the end and are dedicated to getting it done. Go to CrossCountryMortgage.com so Cross Country Mortgage can take care of you through the home buying process. Again, that's CrossCountryMortgage.com cross slash Barstool. 
Cross Country Mortgage LLC and MLS 3029. All loans are subject to underwriting approval. www.nmlsconsumeraccess.org. All right. First of all, this, you were saying you were looking into the Vietnam War. I saw it was the 50th anniversary of the end, and I was looking into it too. And I feel like Americans, like, okay, I get the basic gist of what for Vietnam was because of Forrest Gump or whatever, but like, I didn't even remember. I was like, why did we end up there again? Like, what was the point of that? And I just want to give a quick, and if this sucks, you can cut it, but a, just a quick overview of how we wound up there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'll say it. It was kind of on us a little bit. <laughs> kind of on us. Yeah. Yeah. But it was time. It had been almost like 10, 15 we were years since Korea. for yeah. a banger. So, that, should be, that should be the like the litmus test if we should go to war. Will we remember why we're going in 40 years. years. Because Vietnam, I was like, wait, what was that all about again? So anyway, Mm -hmm. between 1945 and 1954, Vietnam as a whole, North and South together, was like France, the colonizers who had taken it over for forever and ever. We want you gone. They wanted the French out of Vietnam. Which makes sense. I would too. They finally, and meanwhile, U.S.'s backing is given the South, Southern Vietnam, like weapons stuff to help them boot the French out. And it finally works. They boot the French out. And then North was communist, South was regular old Vietnam, and they wanted <laughs> That's to That's actually the official name, regular yeah. old Vietnam. <laughs> regular old that would have been better than South <laughs> Vietnam. Yeah. And they wanted to do, as a whole, they were looking to do um, unification elections to unite the North and the South, which probably would have meant the whole thing We've could been possibly there become communist, okay? Yeah. And the U.S. was like, "Uh uh-uh, we're in a Cold War right now with the people back in the north of Vietnam, so we better come in on the south and keep giving them, tell them, one, don't do the unification elections, Uh uh-uh. So the South Korea, because they were getting so much backing and money from the U.S., they were like, we're not going to do it, North Korea. We're not going to earn North Korea, North Vietnam. We're not, whatever. And so then, essentially, the communists We came in, we were like, North Korea, you need to get out. Yeah, Lyndon Johnson was like, we're going to escalate this bitch. And it went from, like, 2,000 advisors on the ground, U.S. advisors, like, helping South Vietnam and giving weapons and money, blah, 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 to, uh, f- let's see here, hundreds of thousands eventually in the next few years. And then Nixon took over, and he was like, yeah, let's keep ramping this shit up. And they just kept ramping shit up and ramping shit up. And, and then so then it was war. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that this is right, but I— okay. I read. I think you're right too, Kate. I, I think that was a, a great synopsis. A real historian's probably dying right now. <laughs> no, no, I don't think so. I think they're like, yeah, Kate nailed that. I read. I'm pretty sure it was either Korea or it was Vietnam. I read it this morning. It's embarrassing that I can't remember. Ten percent of all men in the United States at that time were drafted. Ten percent. I would have thought it would have been a higher number. I but mean, actually. They, I read somewhere where still the majority was volunteers. I don't know if that's true. Oh yeah, yeah. But still, but yeah, a lot. Of- well, a lot of those are fake volunteers too. Like if you read the yeah. accounts, they'll be like, "Oh, I got drafted, so now I'm gonna pick which one I want to right. go to," and that no longer means you were drafted. Um, but overall, fifty-eight thousand American lives and three hundred and fifty thousand casualties wounded from that, and over two million Vietnamese deaths, and. Um, yeah, basically, Congress enacted the War Powers Act then in 1973, requiring the president to receive explicit congressional approval before committing American forces overseas. And we'll circle back to that at the end of the show because we've got <laughs> some new news on that there anyway. Yeah. Um, but that's a basic overview of how we got there. And I just, I kind of wasn't 100% sure on that. I knew it was like us versus the communists type deal, but whatever. Anyways, round one. So <laughs> I lo- That was the Katie context. Amazing. That was so good. Okay. You did the roundup there. I loved it. Okay. I tried my best. I don't know. <laughs> no, you did great. I'm be- not being facetious. I'm being for real. So and, and I feel like every war we've gotten sucked into, like same with, I don't know. Look at the Soviets and then when we were back in Afghanistan against the Soviets who had taken over. Like I feel like so many of the wars we get sucked into start as just dipping our toe in the proxy war pond. And next oh, thing you know, time. we get sucked into a quagmire. That seems to be our M.O. We're so, hanging out in Korea or in yeah. Ukraine right now. Yeah, you know, so yeah, there we go again. Anyways, round number one. When the Vietnam conflict ended in 1973, 566 military prisoners of war were returned from captivity in North Vietnam. Over 30 years later, medical and psychological tests of approximately 300 of those prisoners showed few medical, social, and psychological problems, which is shocking. 
How can yeah. you go through six, seven years of torture and come out on the other end of it okay? And the answers are varied and complex, but one thing was clear. The main thing, the glue that held their brains together was they had a system of human connection that they worked, they had to work towards it every single day, couldn't get lazy, which I can see me just sitting there and finally one day being like, fuck it, I'm just letting my brain go. I'm just done. I'm just going to like zone out. They had to work towards this every single day and stay grounded and in control of their minds. And a big part of it was humor, was having mm -hmm. a sense of humor was a big part of that glue. Um, though they were certainly victimized by their captors, they didn't see themselves as victims no matter what was done to them. As a POW in the Hanoi Hilton, I recall nothing from military survival training that explained the use of meat hooks suspended from the ceiling. It would hang above you in the torture room like a sadistic tease. You couldn't drag your gaze from it, said one POW. During a routine torture session with the hook, the Vietnamese would tie a prisoner's hands and feet and then bind them to their hands and ankles. So you'd be like in a backwards teardrop shape, like hogtied essentially. And then they would hang you up by those ropes on the meat hook. You couldn't breathe, you were bowed and bent in half, and you were hoisted up to hang by those ropes. And the guards would return to keep tightening them and tightening them. It could be for hours, it could be for days. All feeling would be gone. Your limbs would start to swell and turn purple. I mean, it's, you can't think of a torture worse than that. You're slowly no. suffocating as you And you're... You, can't, you can't, but there was way worse than that. Like some of the, sh like that oh, one so is, worse. like that is unimaginable to go through. Really? Like I was yeah. trying to think, when I was reading it, I was like trying to think of what that would feel like. And your brain can't do it. No, like I your don't think. Your brain cannot do it. You can't yeah. replicate it. None of us have, and most people never go through yeah. any Thank sort God. of. Thank God. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so then another, but so just to, that's an example of the kind of shit these guys were going through. Uh, a famous resident of the Hanoi Hilton in 1967, John McCain joined the prisoners there after his plane was shot down. He's got his right knee and arms broken. Um, he was denied medical care until they figured out his dad was a U.S. Navy admiral. So they transferred him to a medical facility and he woke up in a room covered in mosquitoes and rats. Finally, they, they set him in a full body cast, then cut the ligaments and cartilage from his knee. But still, and after that, I think I'd be like, yeah, I'm done. I'm going to check out now and just become a vegetable in here. I'm just like done. He went on to become a known mischief maker and like one of the big morale boosters of that group in the Hanoi Hilton. Navy pilot Jack Fellows recalled about himself and John McCain. We did a Christmas skit together in 1972. Look it at that date. Look at that date, 1967, and now it's 1972. Yep. Jeez. Navy pilot Jack Fellows said, It was cold and there were no windows, but McCain was playing Scrooge and I was Tiny Tim. I was, <laughs> yeah, I was almost nude, wearing something like a diaper, standing off to the side waiting for my cue. So they're putting on a play in this dull, cold, dark room for the other people in the room, the other prisoners in the room. And this Fellows guy is freezing. He's wearing like a diaper. It's freezing cold. Um, and he's just ready to get up and do his part so he can go get warm again or whatever, like in his little corner. But McCain knows that he's freezing his dick off. And so he proceeds to give a 10, 15 minute dialogue. <laughs> and he keeps looking out of the corner of his eye and everyone's laughing because everyone knows this poor other fellow's guy is freezing <laughs> his dick off. Um, and he said that was so one of the funniest things that kind of shit would happen all the time where they were still, even though they were all in horrible pain, they still kept roasting the shit out of each other because it was funny. It kept them going. Right. And when I was reading all these accounts and all these stories, I thought there's nothing different about any generation of soldier, sailor, airman, or marine. Just mm. no difference. Going back from these stories or when we talked to Woody Williams and when they got the flamethrowers on the beach in World War II, when he's like, we got it out, we just kind of started playing with it. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, yeah, dude, that's what we would have done too. Just play with the flamethrower. Yeah, and the context said, changes, and then maybe the references change, but the, it's all pretty similar. Oh, right. yeah. Um, POWs who maintain strong relationships helped survive over seven years in captivity and have thrived in the years since they've gotten out. Um, as one man stated, believe it or not, even under the worst conditions over there, under the right circumstances, we could laugh. They would say, well, boy, we're going back to look, we're going to look back on this one day and just laugh. <laughs> and and just even saying that was so dark that it made yeah. them laugh, you know. And the la the last part is 
but it sure does hurt now. Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, but like, imagine yeah. being tied up by a meat hook and looking at your buddy and being like, we're totally going to laugh about this one day. Like, that's <laughs> right. so dark that it is funny. Like it It's is like funny. that one meme where the guy has the hangman's noose around his neck and he's like, first time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, literally, it's gallows humor. It's a dark humor. Right. Um, another participant added, the first five months, I didn't have a sense of humor. I was having great difficulty finding anything funny about the situation. But then I discovered by living with other people and the way we interacted that we eventually started being awfully funny. And so he saw like, well, if these guys around me can laugh, then I can too. Then I can join them. And if I can make them laugh, then I'm valuable here because that's I think it would have taken me, me seven years to think anything was yeah. funny. Um, humor allows you to get up every morning and think this isn't the end of the world. So one's sense of humor is pretty critical. And like I've, this is a much smaller scale, obviously, but I've talked about on here after I got out of the military and was in one of my darkest points and I had gotten divorced and I moved back home and I was like really, really depressed. And one day I had a comedian friend down in Philly who sat had, sitting next to me and on a notebook, he's like, write down, start a list. What's funny about this? He's like, I know you can find, cause I was like, there's nothing funny anymore. I don't think any, he's like, sit down and write. I promise you there's something funny about your divorce. I promise you, you can laugh and find something to laugh about. And slowly but surely, he was right. And next thing you know, it was like a flood. It was like, it became this funny thing that I could laugh at. And it wasn't so huge and awful. Do you and, remember any of the things you wrote down? Oh, I still have it. I, I turned it into a stand-up set that I used Yeah, for I've watched while. it on YouTube. Um, so there's, but, you know. But anyway, like, the power of humor, like, truly is really? a morale booster that is absolutely incredible. That's um, what we talked about in the 20-year episode. Like, yeah. the things that you go through there, you have to kind of be like, this is fucked up and talk about the crazy shit yeah yeah absolutely Uh, i think the thing sorry the thing i'm most impressed by these guys it's no different than if you are going on a long ruck march and you just don't know how far you're going and you're just kind of walking when you don't know where the end is that can be such a a, a, you know a way to screw with someone's mind these guys had no idea you know when they were there day one they had no idea if they were going to get rescued in five days or you know five to seven years yeah and that yep. not knowing i, I you would have never thought it, you yes. never would have thought it'd be seven years no never. no, no shot and if you no if shot. you did know this is terrible if i knew i was going to be in that situation for seven years i'm killing myself instantly instantly if i know that I'm, it's going to take me but seven you say years. that but then but what if you had other soldiers around you who were relying on you would you then <laughs> Probably not knowing you. I don't think so. Like, I think that was the power that the unit, they talk about the unit cohesion, the cohesion between these guys and the humor. Like, they had to be there because their buddy needed them to be there. They had to yeah. stay positive because their buddy needed it. Like, I think that was changed the whole vibe. I don't know. I think yeah, really I mean, powerful. being there and having to do, that's the whole thing of really about war. And like, when we talk about having different medals and people are looked at because of the medals that they have, most of that stuff, for a lack of a better word, is it's situational circumstances or it's just fucking bad luck. Like yeah. nobody knows where you're going to be. Mm-hmm. Like Kyle Carpenter, for example, he showed immense bravery. There was tens of thousands of other Marines who stood watch on different places, Marja or Iraq, anywhere in Afghanistan. But he was the one where it happened and he's the one who actually did it. But I also think that there's dozens of, more than that, of other soldier, sailor, marine that would do that same thing. Sure, yeah, for the But he was them. just the one that had to do it. And if he w- could go back, I'm sure he would say, I didn't want to do that shit. <laughs> like, but no I what? bet he would do it yeah. again. You know, but he would, yeah. Goes, yeah. Along so. Kate's point, like I think so often, like maybe it's just because it's top of mind, I was on Twisted History talking about the Medal of Honor, and I think so often these individuals who were awarded the medal of honor and and a lot of medals throughout military history it was because they felt like they needed to go help their buddy so kate to Mm -hmm. your point these people didn't want to give up because maybe they did but they didn't want to let their buddy down and i think that's i think that theme is true throughout the military for all time yeah that's why i like the old story of john basalone so much Mm -hmm. because that's what he did like it was all about bringing his people home twice it wasn't just POWs who had a sense of humor to get through things. Um, there's also, I mean, pretty much everywhere, gallows humor across every war. Uh, mm-hmm. But in November of 1965, the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier USS Midway was conducting airstrikes in the Mekong Delta. This One is of, round two. Yep, this is round number two. 
Um, one of the attack squadrons aboard was tasked with dropping the six millionth pound of ordnance in the war. So the sailors... Cons, off the top of your head, do you remember how much a 155 weighs? Um, It's a little over 100 pounds. It's like 120 so, pounds, I think. That's 600,000, 155 rounds and 6 million, right? Something like that. 600,000? Yeah. If you that's look at how much, how many bombs we dropped across Vietnam and Laos and there was like other countries all around there that we just absolutely, uh, but anyway, six million, <laughs> it was the 6 million, uh, pound of ordinance. So the I wonder if they said, had like streamers, like they do at grocery stores. At the stores grocery when store when the you're the 10,000 5- customer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, so they said, we want to make this six millionth pound special. We want to do something really fun. So commander and pilot Clarence W. Stoddard Jr. was flying the mission in a Sky Raider named Paper Tiger II, and the sailors had armed it with a special weapon on its wing, the six millionth pound, a toilet. (laughs) Obviously, this was not authorized nor standard, uh, nor <laughs> real ordinance. So how did it get on uh, the wing? No shit. Yeah. I, it should be standard. That would be mm-hmm. awesome. So how did it get on the wing of an aircraft? Apparently, the head, nautical jargon for toilet, was damaged, and de- probably a relative of Chaps is damaged. It <laughs> yeah, exactly right. Okay. Um, yeah. The toilet Taking was damaged. Taking out that thing like a pressure washer. And they were going <laughs> to throw it over the edge of the ship, but a plane captain salvaged it prior to anyone giving it a float check. The ordnance men designed a rack, tail fins, and a nose fuse for it, so they made it look like a tiny... It was a toilet that they made look like a tiny little airplane. That's cool. And then cool. They, att- they attached this toilet plane to the wing of the plane. As Paper Taxi 2 taxied to the catapult, the plane checkers positioned themselves to block the porcelain throne from the view of the air boss and the captain. Can't so- you see us doing that shit? <laughs> like, you have a toilet that you put on a helicopter, and you're mm-hmm. like, don't show Skipper. Don't show him. Yeah, this plane, um, they had to hide because obviously they wouldn't let the plane take off with the toilet on the wing, so they had to hide it from the people. As the plane catapulted off the deck, the leaders saw it, and a message came over the radio asking, what the hell was on the 572's right wing? Like, what yeah, they basically the buzzed the that? tower, but with mm-hmm. a toilet. With a toilet. <laughs> um, reportedly, jokes came down from air intelligence about germ warfare being conducted. Just a little poop goofing. Um, as Clint Johnson... <laughs> The air controller arrived on station over the target. Stoddard read out a list of ordnance, concluding with, and one codenamed Sandy Flush. And <laughs> off it went. They chopped the little string off the wing. It went flying. He recalls that Stoddard went into a dive and dropped the Sandy Flush. When it came off the plane, the toilet turned whole to the wind and nearly struck the aircraft. Oh, my uh, God. The FAC reported that the toilet whistled the entire way down. Imagine, <laughs> imagine fucking crashing your plane because you were toilet goofing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and apparently people, there was footage of this at the time. The guys even like strapped an old ass camera to the wing so they could watch the toilet fall all the way down. See, they um, should if they would have had GoPro for that, it would be incredible. I mean, yeah. Go, like that's why we're fortunate. We can come back and look at some of our memories in 1080p. They didn't have that. Yeah. So, you know, just a little toilet goofing, just a little way to have I mean, fun they, we there. got the picture right here. It, it looks pretty cool. It looks it so does. odd to have a toilet strapped to the wing, but it, it kind of fits. Look at the second fits. one. Did you guys look at the second yeah. one where yeah. it's like a legit fighter plane and they have other big ordinances on it that would fuck some place. Like it's the one that they drop in Forrest Gump, essentially. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then there's three of those in, on each wing, but one of the other ones is just a toilet. See, if I would if I was the pilot there... I think I would have come up with an excuse like, look, they're out. We have seven. We need eight to be to have even weight distribution. So we found this toilet. We're going to give it a go. <laughs> and as we're in like a story like that spreads, like anything that's good for morale, I feel like an officer has to let it go. As long as yeah. nobody, as long as it didn't turn back around and truly hit the plane and crash. Everyone, I mean, that's you know. the reason why they let them cut off their camis where they are having yeah. different shit on their helmets. Like it's because you need something to keep you going. Yeah. Anything. Yeah. So I'm okay with that. Mm-hmm. There and there's another story that came back too. It wasn't just the toilet, but there was also another one where they did the same thing, but a, with a kitchen sink. So they said that they were throwing everything at the enemy, including the kitchen sink. <laughs> love that. You love it. That's awesome. Do. That's I awesome. I love that too. I was looking up other stories and there's just countless amounts of tales that where that happened. And I think a lot of times the Vietnam vets still get overlooked, um, and it's sad, like the things that they went through and how long they went through it. 
they deserve all the attention that yeah. everybody else gets because they did what was they weren't even really volunteers a lot of them they didn't right. volunteers and they still went performed admirably and they did what they were supposed to do so i have a lot yeah. of respect for vietnam vets for sure yeah and it's just unfortunate like obviously some horrible things happened in vietnam you know my Lai comes to mind so that gets marred because of a horrific act and i'm not defending me Lai by any stretch that was horrible should have never happened but i think because of instances like that vietnam vets all get lumped in like oh you were all terrible people and that's just not the case as you said a lot of them just got drafted some of them signed up but they just went where they were told to go so they deserve their, their thanks and praise just like everybody else yeah it's another one of those circumstances where we shouldn't have been there but the people that were there did the best that they could right that they could with what they knew yep mm-hmm all right. All right, let's move on to round number three. And this is going to be our interview with Charlie Plum. I really enjoyed talking to him. This was from a couple years ago. And sitting there and listening to him talk, he's a very successful businessman, owns multiple planes himself. He says that he flies almost every single day. And think about that, man. Like if for me, I don't shoot guns anymore because I don't really like to be around them after mm-hmm. getting shot. There's certain ones like a hunting rifle that David Faraday just sent me. What he like he talked about uh, when he when we interviewed him. I don't go out and shoot because I don't like to be around that. Imagine crashing your plane, and then being put in a place like Hanoi Hilton and being like, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna fly again. Mm-hmm. Like that kind of exposure therapy from the Vietnam vets that went through that that 566 way outside what I'm able to do courageously or bravely. I just can't imagine doing all that stuff. Listen to Charlie Plum while he talks about his memories from there, the things that he regrets, the things that he learned from, and how his experience as a prisoner of war for six and a half years shaped his life. Here's Charlie Plum. Now on Zero Block 30, we are privileged to have Captain Charles Plum. He graduated from the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland in 1964. And then he went on to become a fighter pilot, where he was one of actually the first fighter pilots ever at Top Gun. I'm sure you've heard of it somewhere before. He went on to Vietnam after that and flew 74 combat missions before he was shot down over Vietnam. And then he became a prisoner of war for six years. That is burying the lead is what we would call that in the, in the media world. But I am so happy and privileged to have Charles Plum on the show. Charles, thanks for joining us. Great to be with you, Jeff and Katie. Yes, thanks so much. So I wanted to have you on this show because I think that of anyone who understands what the world is kind of going through in isolation and sitting, spending time alone, it's somebody that has your story. And it's re- your story has really touched me. I'm sure you never thought that it would correlate to people in everyday American life whenever you were going through everything. I, you know, I really didn't. But uh, in fact, the more I look at it, the more I see the correlation. You know, we, we are at war. Uh, you know, we're facing an enemy with, that we can't see, that uh, we can't predict. Uh, our enemy seems to be everywhere and nowhere, this virus. And, uh, you know, kind of like the, the Viet Cong and, and in your war as well. You know, you can't see those guys. And so we're, you know, we're, we're faced with that, with, with, with that uh, war that's going on right now. Good news is I think that we've got, you know, we've got a, a good leadership and, uh, and we've got lots of fine people that are fighting the war. So. And, and whenever you were there, we talk a lot about with um, Afghanistan and Iraq, like whenever you get close to the end of your tour, because I actually want to talk about some of the things that led up. After you, you did 74 combat missions and you had over 100 car- carrier landings, whenever that's going on, getting closer to the end of your deployment, your time, were you thinking – about just going home? Did you have that view of that I'm almost there? I've almost reached the end of my tunnel? I, I certainly did. And, uh, you know, the other guys did too. And, in fact, I heard that some of the Air Force fighter pilots that actually would stop them from flying the last 10 days or so because you really get that get-home-itis and, mm-hmm. uh, and you start making mistakes. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll never forget that the last flight that I was on, my 75th mission, and I'm looking at this, at, at this armada of airplanes with big, big strike, three aircraft carriers, five Air Force bases, I don't know how many hundred airplanes. And I, I could just see airplanes from, from horizon to horizon. And I felt to myself how lucky I am, you know. I've, I'm, I've, uh, I've uh, survived 74 missions. I've hassled with the MiGs. I've taken hits from uh, 
triple A and, and missiles and, and I'm still alive and I'm going home. And, uh, you know, I, I look back to those few minutes when that missile hit and think to myself, I wonder if I just didn't get a little too complacent. So. And do you I ever, you, I know cause whenever I got shot, I put a lot of the blame on myself and did a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking. I imagine for somebody in your position, whenever, and I watched a, a a speech that you gave in 2012, I believe it was, when you had on really hard, hard-nosed hard shoes and you made it a point to walk three paces one way and three paces another way. I imagine you Monday morning quarterbacked in your brain while you were taking those three paces in your eight-foot cell over and over and over again. You're very perceptive. Uh, that's exactly what was happening. And I felt uh, very ashamed and very guilty that's what I'd done. Uh, and, you know, to the point, to the point that I just really wondered if I could ever uh, come back to the States and face my fellow fighter pilots when I had, uh, when I had, uh, had just failed in my mission. And, uh, and, and yeah, I certainly did. I beat myself up pretty good about that. And going through and spending, spending time there, was there ever a time whenever you were there? Because I also saw and you've written a lot about it as well, where you talk about having a positive mental attitude oftentimes was a killer for prisoners of war. You know, it was. I think, um, I think the, the actual secret was to keep it real, okay? Because you can positively think yourself right out of reality. And, uh, and so it was a balance for me. Now, uh, Jim, Jim Stockdale was our leader for a while. He was a commander of the air group, uh, and he was shot down. And so he was a, the senior uh, POW for a while. And, um, and he's quoted in, in a couple of uh, books about saying it was the optimists that died in the prison. And, and in fact, and I, I approached him on that when I was still alive because I was very, I was very optimistic, you know, mm -hmm. I think, it had a little bit to do with my age. You know, I was one of the youngest guys there, so I was optimistic. But what, what uh, Admiral Stockdale and I finally decided upon, when it wasn't necessarily optimism or pessimism, it was realism. Mm -hmm. and, and his whole approach to leadership was, hey, I'm going to tell you the truth. You know, we're in trouble. Uh, this is going to be difficult. You're going to see some pain through this. But also, I'm going to tell you the truth, is we have an opportunity here. We're still... We are still warriors. We are still serving. We're not on the defensive. You know, pull up your big boy pants. Let's get on with this thing. And that was his whole approach and his whole attitude. It turned the whole thing around. And going through something like that, I've, I've read stories about prisoners of war from Vietnam learning to tap on the wall to develop a sense of communication. How long did that take for you to be able to feel like I'm making any type of communication? Well, it was difficult because of very cumbersome code. And I, re I was still in solitary confinement. Uh, and I, 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 uh, I listened, I, I heard this noise in the corner of my prison uh, cell and I thought it was a cricket. It was a wire scratching on the concrete floor and had a, a note wrapped around the end of it with this code. The code was various numbers of tugs on a wire to represent various letters of the alphabet or abbreviations. And so, I, so I memorized the code, I ate the note, and, um, and began to communicate, but it was really slow for a long time. And, but we found that communication was absolutely uh, vital, life-saving. You know, just, it was truly the difference in life or death. The guys that were put in a far corner of a prison camp and couldn't or, or wouldn't communicate with the rest of the guys probably weren't going to make it. It was just that, that serious. And the key was, it wasn't, wasn't the, the information we were passing around. It was just the simple validation of another human being. Because in those prison cells, when it was dark and, and you were alone in solitary, uh, you know, you'd lose track. You, you, you wouldn't know if you were alive or dead. No feedback, no sounding board. And uh, the, simple, the simple tugging on a wire or tapping on a wall and have somebody tap back at you meant you know, number one, hey, something's re somebody's responding to something I am doing physically, thus I exist. And number two, somebody cares. And uh, it was just that, that uh, comfort, you know, that we got from that communication, that validation that really saved our lives. For, 
Well, that had to be those little tiny moments I would imagine of any positivity at all are extremely amplified in conditions like that. Were there, I feel almost silly asking this, were there moments, any moments of happiness and joy that you remember from that long span of time? Absolutely. You know, uh, I remember laughing until my stomach ached at some of the things that, that we did for each other. You know, every holiday we celebrated, uh, every birthday, we'd have these wild birthday parties where, hmm. you know, we, we, we would have a, a, an orchestra and great meals and a big birthday cake shaped like an aircraft carrier where naked ladies jumped out of the flight deck. You know? <laughs> and, and yeah, see, it was, all, it was all in our imagination. It was all the guys next door were throwing this birthday party for me and, and it was all tapping on the wall with this code. <laughs> and uh, so the birthday party lasted all day, but boy, was it fun. <laughs> wow. <Amazing. laughs> that is unbelievable. And I, I, six years is so difficult to wrap my head around. Like I, I trying to think of what six years in that would be looking back for you all these years later, is it kind of like a dot on the line or do you, do you have really expansive memories? No, it's well, I, I guess to tell you the truth, both, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a motivational speaker. I, I make a living telling this story and I've made over 5,000 presentations in the last 47 years. And so I relive this story uh, several times a week, but, mm-hmm. I, but I pick out the positive parts of it because there's lots and lots of parts, uh, positive parts, you know, of, of any challenge in life. And one of my bylines is adversity is a horrible thing to waste because we learn from challenges like this. And I know, I know that you are really uh, concerned about PTSD and, and that you work a lot with that. Well, Here's a statistic you might not know. A study was done about five years ago. Of all the combatants of Vietnam, 30.6% have PTSD. Of the prisoners of war, 4% of us have PTSD. And the psychologists and psychiatrists are trying to figure this out because, you know, you would think that six years in a prison camp would be about as much stress as a guy would want to to take. And, uh, you know, why would you not have PTSD symptoms because of that? Well, <clears throat> what, because we've, we've done really well. From 591 men, we've got uh, 17 generals and seven admirals. Most of us retired as senior grade military officers. We went back to flying airplanes. I still fly airplanes today uh, and, and commanding ships and fleets and all over the world. And, and I don't mean to cut you off, but I think that that's no. so important. Like being a captain, whenever I read your story and seeing you, you got there to Vietnam <laughs> captured at 24 years old, weren't released until 30. To me, the concept of staying in the Navy after you return is so foreign from where I believe my brain would be at and that you continued to serve and went on to, to lead an entire carrier just absolutely blew my mind in your, in, in, from your bio. Why did you want – I would want to put on the uniform a- again. I'm thinking of last year when I tried rollerblading and fell, and I was like, I'm never rollerblading again. <laughs> <So> <laughs> you know, that's really that's really a good question, a good point. But but most of us, most of the people that is uh, in Vietnam came back and stayed in the military. You uh, you know, I don't know why why does anybody stay in the military? Uh, you know, why 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 do Marines go back into the fight? You know, mm-hmm. you, you went back, Katie. <laughs> apparently <laughs> so uh, it's just the dedication to have you find something you can do a way that you can serve and you and you you have a purpose you know a purpose in life and um, I came back I, I married my high school sweetheart the day after I graduated from Annapolis she hung on for five years and filed for divorce three months before I came home <clears throat> oh, and so I yeah that was you know, another gut punch um, but uh, you know I I had survived, you know, nearly six years in a prison camp. And I'm, you know, I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to survive this too. And so one of the, you know, one of the places where I was felt most comfortable was back in uniform, back Mm -hmm. flying airplanes. And so uh, I went, I went back to flying jets Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and and it worked. I've, I, of course, I'm I'm, uh, remarried and have, four kids and four grandkids and uh, live a very happy life. 
And I think that, that I love your Instagram account too, because whenever I saw some of your videos, you talk about how you're in the hangar. And I just assumed that because you're a pilot Navy guy, you, you called like your man cave, your hangar. No, you have like an actual plane in there. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> not a, not a bad stunt to have your own plane. I love that. Um, <laughs> So I know that you had a very special relationship with John McCain. Can you tell us what he meant to you? John was my flight instructor in Meridian, Mississippi. He taught me to fly jets. Uh, a tough, tough instructor, but he wanted all of us, you know, to, to learn the craft, and, and we did. And then he showed up five months later than I. He was shot down five months after I was. And, uh, and of course, I, I was one of the first guys to recognize him and communicate with John McCain. Well... <clears throat> He's, he, and he turned out to be one of the toughest guys in that prison camp. He had seven broken bones and he was shot down. And they were twisting his broken bones to torture the poor guy. Uh, but he was just as, just as tough as nails. Anytime there was any interruption in, in the camp agenda, you knew who was behind it. You know, McCain was always causing trouble, just a maverick. Uh, and so, yes, have a lot of respect, respect for John. I uh, don't agree with all of his po- uh, politics, but uh, in fact, I, I helped bury him uh, here last year in Annapolis in the, in the cemetery there. So when you heard stories that would uh, fuck, that would float out there about John McCain and about like there's nicknames for him being Songbird, which I always thought was such trash that people would do that to him. What were your thoughts of being somebody that was there with John McCain? Well, it's, John's not perfect like like most of the rest of us. I got a call from Anderson Cooper um, when uh, Trump said that McCain was not a hero. Remember that mm-hmm. little yes. episode? Yep. And uh, Anderson asked me, you know, I was live on his TV show, what do, you, what do you think about Trump saying McCain is not a hero? My response was, hey, M- McCain doesn't call himself a hero. You will not find very many military guys that will accept that moniker. You know, in fact, the name of my book is I'm No Hero. That's just kind of the whole point. Uh, and so I said, it's kind of a moot point. You know, McCain's not going to argue the fact that he's not a hero because he doesn't think he is one. Well, John McCain had a lot of faults, and uh, as we all do. And, and there were, you know, a lot, a lot of reasons, I think, why somebody wouldn't, uh, wouldn't think that he was a hero. But, oh, by the way, um, as I say, he was certainly a hero of mine and one of the toughest guys I ever met. Oh, I, I imagine so. The things that he went through and the, that you went through too. When you came back, what was what was life adjusting? Because we, I mean, you hear from prisoners a lot, but prisoners of war a little bit different. What was your how was your transition back from Vietnam back to America? Things had changed here. That total of seven years, I was gone, and uh, you know, it was like Rip Van Winkle waking up mm. after a long sleep. Well. Um, you know, the styles had changed, the music had changed, the humor had changed, everything changed. But it was exciting for me back to get back into the swim of things. You know, uh, for whatever reason, uh, Kansas had not canceled my driver's license. <laughs> so I hopped back in a car after not ridden one for seven years. This is in the Great Lakes Naval Hospital <laughs> near Chicago. And I'm dri- driving down a freeway and I see in front of me this good looking blonde, you know, and, and, and uh, I'm, I got to check this out. And I drive up next to her and she's got a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, Me too. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, uh, it, it, but it, it was, it was a thrill. It was no problem at all. Uh, you know, I had dreamed about that moment uh, and, it, and, and lived it in that prison camp a thousand times. I had uh, dreamed about flying airplanes and, and uh, traveling and reading and seeing. And, you know, it, it just it, it came, it came very naturally to me. After, after you did get out, did you have a mentor or anyone? Did the military say, we know that had to be incredibly difficult. Here are some people who are going to help you through it. Or were you kind of on your own? No, I had a lot of help. But, it, but uh, a lot of it really didn't, uh, didn't make much sense. The the first person that with I the met, military no <laughs> <laughs> well uh, the first person well, well first of all of course I did not know that my wife had filed for divorce okay and so uh, every every prisoner of war coming out of uh, of North Vietnam 
and an escort. And the escort knew all about my bank estate, you know, statement and all this stuff, but he, he wouldn't tell me anything about my wife. And of course, that's the first thing I asked. And so, uh, and, and so I got to Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines, and the first guy there was going to be a psychiatrist. I'm going to see this psychiatrist. And I asked him about my wife. He wouldn't tell me either. And he said, he said, let me tell you what's going to happen to you. Uh, when, you know, when I start telling you this news, you're going to go into deep depression. You're going to get really angry. You, and, and, and he said, I want you to go back to your hospital room and pound on the walls and kick in the door and tear your pillow apart. Just get really, really, because if you don't, if you don't let this out, you know, if you don't, uh, show this this vitriol that's all within you right now. Eventually, you're going to have a mental breakdown. Well, I said, but but Doc, I don't feel that way. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't. I'm happy, man. <laughs> I got a I got a doorknob on the inside of my door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what 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 could yeah. be better than that? The little things now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so he said, no. He said, uh, you. I said, I guarantee you that uh, if you don't get this out of your system, the sooner the better. If, if you don't get it out, the, the longer you wait, the more, the more tragic this mental breakdown will be. Well, that was uh, 47 years ago. I'm still waiting for the mental breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, you know, they were concerned, and they assumed that we would be zombies. They had our families brief to institutionalize us the rest of our lives. Because, you know, they, they just thought we'd be vegetables coming out of there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and I guess it's kind of logical to expect that those kind of conditions for that long, you know, you, you could never be normal again. But, um, you know, you know like, like I said, we've 591 guys come back. We've got two ambassadors from our number, a governor. Uh, you, you know, they're telling us we're healthier today mentally and physically than we had been prisoners of war. Wow. And in fact, talk about, uh, you know, PTSD, we are sort of the poster boys for, uh, for a new moniker, PTG. Don't know if you've heard of that, post-traumatic post growth, growth. Yeah. growth uh -huh. that you can actually grow through these, th these uh, periods of stress. And, uh, and so, in fact, there's a <clears throat> I'm, I'm a part of a, of, of a program, it's called Boulder Crest. And it's really, a, it, 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 it's run, well, it's it partially run by the psychologists who have come up with post-traumatic growth and, uh, and, and really doing great work in Virginia and in uh, uh, Arizona, Boulder Crest. And I know General Mattis is a big proponent of that too. He's talked about it yeah. in given speeches and things like yeah. that. For those yep. that are listening to our show that are younger and they need some advice of what to do to keep yourself bored while you're quarantined, did you have any games that you developed while you were in Vietnam that you would play by yourself? All kinds of games. I started by going back through my mind and trying to remember every book I'd ever read, every movie I'd ever seen, wow. every girl I'd ever dated. Now, that was the fun part. <laughs> Short list. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and that took about three months. So I'm 24 years old, okay? Three months to, to exhaust my memory. And then, so then I started to plan ahead. And I planned the next 20 years of my life around my wife, of course. Mm -hmm. In fact, when, when I, 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 I planned it one direction, staying in the military, uh, another direction, uh, just cruising along, and a third direction, and I still wasn't home. <laughs> so <laughs> I kept thinking about that. But yes, um, and of course, once we got communication with, with everybody else, uh, we played games. Can you imagine? a four-handed bridge in four different prison cells oh using, using, um, using uh, toilet paper to make your cards out of, okay? Uh, it, it, it was, I mean, obviously, it would, it would take all day, but we – You had, had nothing four, but time. Exactly, exactly. And, 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 and that's what we were, you know, doing. We were – Exercise time. No, we had all kinds of games. Uh, anybody that anybody could come up with. Now, had, did you ever, whenever you were there, one of the games, was it, because I know that as an officer, you're a smart guy, went to the Naval Academy, <laughs> knew exactly how much money you were supposed to make. 
were you <laughs> calculating when I come back, this is how much back pay I'm going to get? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, yeah, we calculated all of that. Uh, and, and, you know, and we made plans. We spent that money. Oh, I bet. Uh, yeah, one of the guys sailed around the world. That's what he was going to do, buy a sailboat. In fact, he came back and did it. He came wow. back and spent his money and, and, uh, and, in fact, homeschooled his kids on this sailboat uh, around wow. the world. Um, one guy, with him, he was from uh, South Carolina. He was going to come back and be a pig farmer. And he had everything figured out about where he's, you know, how he's going to buy the farm and raise the pigs. Yeah. And so, uh, so it's like the pig version of Bubba from Forrest Gump. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but visu- visualization, huge thing in moving yourself forward and staying positive and keeping going. And I think that's, is that one of the things that really gave you hope and made you say, I am going to get through this? Absolutely. And, you, you know, visualization allows you to escape your surroundings. And, uh, you know, back, back to your question, chaps, about, you know, people that are homebound now. Uh, and, it, it, you know, obviously I was homebound, isolated for 2,103 days. And um, it, it, it took a while, you know, to figure this out, to be, to be comfortable uh, in, my, in myself. But, you know, we, we wrote poetry, we wrote songs, we, you know, I, I, I made a piano. I, you know, I, 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 I've been a musician, uh, but never played the piano. But I knew that my span would, uh, would span nine, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, an octave plus two. I could span uh, no, octave plus one, nine notes on this piano. So I drew that, a piano keyboard. I knew where the black uh, keys were and the white keys. And I, and, and I would play this piano. The interesting part, now, of course, I, you know, I, I didn't know that much about piano. But I knew chords and, and you know, and the basics, sharps and fats, flats and, and majors and minors and that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and so I would play this piano. The interesting, and it's just scratched out on my board bed, mm-hmm. right? And, uh, and the interesting part was, after two or three months <clears throat> of playing this piano, when I would hit a wrong note, I would actually hear that error, that wow. discord in my mind. You know, it was just, you know, talk about visualization. It, mm-hmm. it really was true that uh, we could do that. Amazing. And incredible. Final question for me. All these years later um, and, and throughout the course of moving on past that, did you ever have contact again with any of the people who imprisoned you or did you ever, would you ever dream of going back? And I mean, I know it's impossible, you know, it's, but do you ever no, think I, about that? I actually, I went back uh, three years ago. They, uh, they <laughs> the head of the history department, University of Hanoi uh, contacted me several years ago, wanted me to come back for a project that he was doing. He wanted me to meet the, the fighter pilots that I'd fought against. And, you know, I, I, had gotten these dog fights in my airplane, and so he wanted me to meet these guys. He wanted me to meet the uh, the the uh, the camp commander, the warden, the the enemy uh, who was in charge of the prison camp, and also in charge of all of our torture. He wanted me to come back and meet this guy. Well, I resisted. I really didn't have a whole lot of uh, interest. And finally, he said, "Hey, you know, this guy's in his 80s, and uh, really want to put you two guys together before he dies." And so I said, well, if you, you know, if you pay for a, a vacation for my family, I'll bring my family over there. <clears throat> so uh, Susan and three of our four kids uh, and, and I went back to Vietnam. I imagine you never thought that'd be a vacation site for you while you were there. Uh, yeah. n- no, I didn't. But, <laughs> uh, uh, but it's changed a lot and the people are nice and, you know, it, it really was. And there's some really beautiful places in, in Vietnam <clears throat> that I had seen from the air, but never on the ground. So I met with the camp commander, and it was really interesting. I went to his house, and uh, he, he, when he saw me, he smiled, and he wanted to hug me. You know, and I, I was just really surprised. And his first words to me were, um, I, I, I was proud to be your warden from 1968 to 1972. And my finest moment, he said, was keeping you healthy and happy during your stay here, <laughs> I'm saying, Bubba, huh. it's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, you don't remember. <laughs> I, I bet you wanted to throw on some gloves and just give it to him right there. 
<laughs> well, you know, I, uh, my mother taught me forgiveness a long time ago, and I found that uh, forgiveness was, was one of the survival techniques. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and so, no, I'd, I'd forgiven this guy a long time ago, and I didn't have any axe to grind. Uh, but it was just kind of interesting that he denied. I talked to him for an hour. He totally denied ever harming a prisoner of war. Interestingly enough, okay, my entire time, well, I was there for 11 days, I, and I talked to cab drivers, and I spoke at the embassy, I went to the university, I spoke to a lot of people out there. Nobody, nobody would ever admit that Americans were tortured uh, during the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. my, last, my last day there, okay, I, I'm, I'm in the park. I, I sent my family home. I'm still in this park in the middle of Hanoi. And there's, here's this lady selling postcards in the park. And I can tell she was my age or maybe a little bit younger. She's missing her entire right leg, okay? She's just got her, her, her black pajamas tied in a knot. And she's on crutches with this bag over her, over her shoulder. Postcards? Who wants to buy a postcard? She was speaking excellent English. And I said, oh, I'll buy a postcard, but I want to know your story. Sit down on this park bench with me and, 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 and tell me your story. She was flattered that I wanted to know. I said, how'd you lose your leg? She said, linebacker two. Now, linebacker two was, this, was the B-52 bombings, but it was, it was a secret word, you know? It was, and I was really surprised to hear her come back with that. You know, I mean, I would think you would say it was an air raid, you know, or mm -hmm. B-52s or something, but linebacker two. So, <clears throat> so, uh, so I, 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 I sort of, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I better figure out if she's legit. I said, what was the date? And uh, she said, oh, 24 December 1972. I said, yep, that was a linebacker too, all right. That was the B-52 bombings that actually ended that war. <clears throat> well, so, uh, so we, we got to talking, and, 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 and I said, you speak great English. You're out here selling postcards, eating, eking a living. I said, uh, uh, you, sh you could be an interpreter, or you could be a docent in one of the museums. Oh, no, she said with a real serious look on her face that uh, the government would never give an invalid a permit to do something like that. Mm. So I'm thinking, okay, here are two, two people on this park bench, both scarred by this war. One of them has two airplanes, two sailboats, drives a big car, lives a wonderful life. And, and the, 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 the other, and she was at least as smart as I am, was... was uh, selling postcards in a park. And I'm, I'm thinking the only difference in the two of us was the society in which we live. That in, in the United States, we have an opportunity to do anything we want, to be anything we want, to, 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 to succeed uh, in anything we want. And she did not because of the communist nature of her, of her government. Wow. So, so she finally said, well, she said, what, she said uh, you're about my age, what were you doing on Christmas? Of 1972, I said I was right here with you. She said mm -hmm. you were a prisoner of war. I said yeah, I was a prisoner of war. I said tell me this: you've been to the museums, you know the history. Uh, do you think the prisoners of war were or tortured? Oh no, she said no. The prisoners were treated better than the civilians during that war. I said how do you know that? Oh, I said uh, government documentaries. They show us these documentaries, and we know the truth about the prisoners of war in Vietnam. <laughs> so, I don't know, makes you pretty, uh, pretty happy yeah. to be an American. Yeah, yeah, that'll do it, that'll do it, <laughs> my goodness. Well, Captain yeah. Plum, we appreciate you taking the time out of your yeah. busy schedule to join us here on our show. We'd love to have you back sometime because we haven't even scratched the surface of your amazing life. Yes. Absolutely, chaps, I enjoy being with you and I've listened to a lot of your podcasts. You guys are doing a great job you know, for the troops and retired uh, guys and gals out there. I, I salute you for that. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Sir. The name, the name of your book one more time in case anybody it, wants to. Sure. It's I'm no hero. Uh, it's in its 33rd printing <laughs> and my website is charlieplum.com, C-H-A-R-L-I-E-P-L-U-M-B.com. And I autograph every book that I sell off that website. So, if, uh, so. And, and of course I'm, I'm on social media, you know, as Chap said, I'm, I'm doing a series now on, uh, you know, on 
staying at home and, 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 and yeah. all the challenges and you have. And it's great. If you need a little pick-me-up, I was telling Mr. Plum before we actually started that whenever my truck got stolen uh, <laughs> last week or whatever it was, I was feeling real sad sack Sally about myself and went back on Instagram and saw him talking about perseverance and I snapped out of it real damn quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah that'll Good do for it. you guys. <laughs> yes, but we'll right, definitely Mr. be tagging him. Thank you him so and, much. Yes, you'll yeah. be able to okay. find him there, and we'll put a link to your book too. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, thank thanks, you, sir. Thank, thanks, Katie. Thanks, Jabs. Every time I go back and listen to that interview, I'm always blown away by yeah. what. There's really three interviews that I will go back and listen to whenever I'm feeling kind of down. It's Stanley Rubin, Charlie Plum, and Robert Sweat. Those are the ones that I go back to Put because things all in perspective. of right puts everything into perspective and the historical context gives me a greater appreciation from times past and i'm sure you guys feel that way too with some of the other people how i feel when i listen to our trace adkins interview <laughs> yeah <laughs> trace <laughs> adkins yeah donk, donk, donk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's written about cons people yep yeah. let's move on to katie news roundup kate what we got here Couple quick things. One, rare lizards near Fort Carson, Colorado are on the struggle bus because <laughs> of noise from a local military base. It's checkered whiptails. You all know mm, them, the Colorado yeah, checkered of whiptails. Of course. Um, we should have had Billy Football on to explain We should have. He's our resident herpetologist. Um, well, apparently there's so many aircraft from the base going by overhead, they have found that these, and it's only the lady lizards, are eating more and sleeping more. They're just dealing with it by saying, I can't even. They're getting out the haagen and they're just <laughs> dishing. They can't deal. They're, they're sitting on the mega yeah. couch eating bonbons. Yeah, I guess the noise of the aircraft. Have you ever had a bonbon? No. no, but I feel like that was very prevalent in sitcoms for us yeah. growing up. That was bon always bons, mentioned. Yeah. Yes. That's women do be eating bonbons. Okay. Yeah, that was the thing. <laughs> I just do. like they, that. There's freaking Peggy they Bundy. Do. They be eating bonbons and they be shopping. Women but they just shopping. remind me, little PFCs around base, around Fort Carson, who are tired of their jobs, just going to their rooms, cracking open their, their fucking cores like. Anyway, whatever. How okay. many of those troops do you think got one of those lizards and is like the barracks pet? And has eaten one in the smoke pit? Probably several. <laughs> no, I mean just they captured the lizard. Did you guys do that with like hedgehogs? No, chucking no. whiptails in the barracks. Mm -mm. Oh, I, I, there was one of the Marines that I was with. He loved the hedgehogs. And after, whenever we would be in like a house, he would look for one. And there was one time he came out and he pulled one out of his pocket. And he was like, I got a hedgehog. <laughs> and everybody's like, that. yeah, hedgehog. You know what's funny um, about hedgehogs? I think we all grew up with Sonic, and you see a hedgehog for real, and you don't think it's actually going to look like that. You're like, why the fuck are no, you not cute blue? Cute as a button. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Up next is Katie News Roundup. Let's talk you oh, more yeah, newsy. Yeah. Jesus. Mm -hmm. huh. um, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay. Sorry. The Senate on Wednesday voted to repeal the legal justifications used to attack Iraq in 91 and 2003, endorsing a rare bipartisan effort by Congress to revoke the authority to wage war from the executive branch, just days after the 20-year anniversary of the start of the Iraq war. Yeah, yeah. I think they actually met the supermajority standard of 60 votes. Yeah, so everybody was like, well, lesson learned, like maybe that. we did learn something, you know? Nah. No, they just they just wanted to take it away from Biden. They're worried that he'll fall asleep and put us be like, oh, yeah, <laughs> hit, hit a button. He's not supposed yeah. to <laughs> uh, Let's bomb this country. <laughs> Senator Tommy Tuberville from Alabama. He's been holding up 160 defense nominees. He's been holding up their promotions um, because the military is helping military women get the abortions that they need. Mm -hmm. um, the first term Republican has been blocking the military promotions as a protest against the DOD policy that grants service members leave and travel allowances for non-covered reproductive health care, including abortion procedures. Three months ago, I informed Secretary Austin that if he tried to turn the DOD into an abortion travel agency, I would place a hold on all civilian flag and general officer nominees. Um, Talk to someone Just in the military, dude. The Learn about military up, readiness. Tommy. Maybe, maybe like if you actually cared about the troops at all and had a reality, uh, real hold on the situation, you wouldn't be doing that. And so hopefully they figure that out soon. And I, I don't usually like the veteran <laughs> shame or like say that you not veteran shame, but like you have to be a veteran to do that. If you're gonna hold up military promotions, you better be a veteran. Yeah. Because that's, yeah. that, I mean, that shit, you work, these high level flag officers, it's not like you're holding up a Lance Corporal to corporal promotion. Right. These people yeah. have been working 35, 40 years to get these promotions. 
And to put it because you're playing partisan bullshit is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You got to be a veteran if you're going to make that stance, I feel And for a cause that, quite frankly, hurts readiness of the military, just flat out. So anyway, um, and then finally, on an incredibly, horribly sad note, nine soldiers have died in a crash involving two Black Hawk helicopters out of Fort Campbell, Kentucky on Wednesday night, a training accident that is one of the deadliest in Army history. We say this countless times on here, but you think like, oh, we're in more of a peacetime now and things are, but there's still so many people putting their lives on the line, going out every day, every night, training to protect this country. Mm -hmm. And when things like this happen, it's just so heartbreaking. So our thoughts are with that community. And it's such a freak thing too, because we go through so many levels of safety to ensure that things don't happen during training. Obviously, when you're in combat, there are a lot of factors you can't control. When you're in training, it's a completely controlled environment. You go to great lengths to ensure these sorts of things happen or don't happen, excuse me. So to have a freak accident like this is just really, really sad. Yes, it really it's is. Terrible. Awful news. Yeah. Um, all right, so I'm going to say something here so you guys don't think we're absolute crazy people who can ignore it. We record save rounds and alibis now before we do the rest of the show. So when you hear us be happy and like excited, we didn't just go from that terrible story yeah. into excitement. So, all right, let's move on to some save rounds and alibis. Oh, I got to tell who's going. <laughs> okay, we'll start with you. I was like, is somebody going to fucking talk? <laughs> Once again, I don't really have any. Oh, no. No, 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 no. Show, no, us, no. show us something. Yep, got those adult braces off. I teeth look great. Straight great teeth. Yeah. Bring it in close to the, the camera. Bring it in close. Come in. Oh, wow. They look yeah. great, Kate. They you do. can't really tell much of a difference, but. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, you I can. I think you look fantastic. I can. Kate, yeah. we need to go back to Coney Island again and redo it. <laughs> I know. But you know what? It's always one of those things where, like, it's the same thing as every time I get a haircut. I have this tiny little shred of unrealistic hope that I'm going to look like Cindy Crawford when I walk out of there. Yeah. You know? And then yeah. I don't. I thought I was going to get these off because I have such a toothy. I'm one of those weird, like, People usually are like, oh, those that's a Disney adult smile where it's all gums and top teeth. <laughs> you don't have gums like that. You don't that. have gummy, you have a gummy but smile. But I'm close. Lows. I'm I, danger close. That kind of shit, the big mm. gums gross me out. If you, <laughs> I know that that's bad fault. to say. Not no offense to big gummers out there. But, Kate, if you had big gums, I'm not sure we would have brought you on. Because I can't look I'm at a- that. I'm all top tooth is what I'm saying. I'm all th- you never see the bottoms, okay? I'm but you're tooth. absolutely right about haircuts, Kate. Because Cardi went and got that's what I was gonna have for my safe round. So Kanji, you could probably go after. Yeah. Cardi went and got a haircut this week, took him, and Mohawk City, Fohawk in the back where it points down, almost mm-hmm. like Wild Thing in Hell Major yeah. League where yes. it goes go back. And McCartney comes out, and from the front it just looks like a normal fade type of haircut, and then they were like. Boom! Whenever they were showing me, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And I went bananas and was like, "That's the coolest haircut I've ever seen! You look awesome!" And like went real. And McCartney was peacocking around the house. Oh, yeah. When you're a little kid and you feel like your haircut got nailed, there's not many things better. Like I would say, haircut and getting a new backpack or I'd trapper say even keeper. As an adult. That's sick. Yeah. Yeah. Getting a good carry-on bag? Forget it. That's mm-hmm. great. Oh, yeah. Anyways. Yeah, I was very excited about my leather purse that I got for DC trip. I showed yeah, Connor. I, yeah, it I was even, great. I, yeah, it's I was texting one. Connor for about 20 minutes about a bag. Oh, it was yeah. weird, yeah. especially for me. <laughs> yeah. That's all um, I got, which is sad. That's not sad. It's not sad at all. Also, cons, go ahead. Well, speaking of haircuts, I was just reminded of this memory today or the other day, and I, I wrote it down because I wanted to share it with you. So... I had a a shaved head all through grammar school, three of my four years of high school. College, you know, I grew it out a little bit, not too much. I've never had long hair, but I was thinking back to grammar school, and my dad would just cut my hair in the garage. And one time, he's like, what if we just take all the guards off and just take it down, like, real, real short? I was like, yeah, sure, cool. And I think that was in, like, seventh grade when we did this. So he took it down real short, and I was like, oh, this looks great. I went to school, I don't know, the next day or two, and the principal, who's this, oh, sorry, Sister Geraldine, I'll say her name, Sister Geraldine. There we go. She hated me. She hated me. I was seemingly 
always in trouble. Even when I wasn't doing something wrong, me and my buddies were always the ones they would point to and be like, you're doing something wrong. Why? You don't seem like you're a rap scallion kid. I wasn't really. I guess I, you know, got into a little. (laughs) I think of you like Manny on Modern Family. (laughs) Like that's God. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) No, I was mostly pretty well behaved. I, you know, I did some things here and there, but nothing. I was pretty much a rule follower. So, but I'm walking down the hallway one time. She stopped me. She's like, why is your hair cut that short? She called my parents and said, why does your son's head look like he's a Nazi? My dad lost it. Oh, I bet. Oh, my God. He absolutely As he like, should. As he's he should. not a, he's not a, Jesus how dare you Christ. call my son that? Like, he flipped out on this nun. <laughs> he's um, fucking 10. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I, I just had that memory of uh, cutting my hair real short. And obviously now I cut it really short. So I'd love to see what she's up to now. Show her my haircut. She's probably dead, right. to be honest with you. I say, say yeah, good, sorry. Honestly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what else you got, Cons? Uh, that's about it. Oh. 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 Sorry, really quickly. Because I, I got a lot of flack for my, my take on having a tux. Having a tux is no different than wearing your dress uniform, people. Yeah, but you wear your dress uniform because you're told to. It's like you're right. ordered to. Yeah, but you wear your dress uniform. A lot of times when you're in the military, if you go to like a wedding and it's black tie. I remember I went to a black tie wedding when I was still in the military. Wore my, my dress uniform. Yeah, I mean, I would rather wear that than a tuxedo. But when you're talking about most guys, I would bet 5% of modern men have a, have a tuxedo. Own their own tuxedo. Yeah, it is yeah. probably a smaller number. But I still think it should be higher. So, okay. That's all um, I got. One thing I'm super excited about, if you've been listening to any other podcast, I don't really talk about it much here, but I'm a huge Discovery Plus guy. I love all those shows, like Thousand Pound Sister, Thousand Pound Best Friend. I'm going to start a little thing where I'm going to be talking about it more. I've been wanting something to blog about that I'm passionate about and nobody else blogs about it. Everybody's talking about sports and basketball and baseball and all that shit. Nobody's talking about the fats, Kate. I got a pound sister's getting divorced. What? I know. She's married? Her and, her and Michael. Oh, yeah. Oh, they're both married. They nice. have two two kids. Yeah. Wow. So they're getting divorced. And she just posted a photo sitting on a porch with a very expensive Louis Vuitton bag. So who got her that? Amy mm-hmm. did? Amy. Wow. And I, Amy's husband, I like to call him Simple Michael because he, does, he doesn't talk much. And mm-hmm. uh, he just kind of sits there and agree. And... He looks like he wasn't in danger of being invited to law school. Like, Mm -hmm. whenever he talks, there's no question he wasn't going to do that. (laughs) So I'm excited about that. If you have any TLC shows you want me to get into, because I'm doing all of them. I'm doing My Strange Addiction. I'm going to do Prisoner of Love, which is one where there's like a matchmaking service where the guys are in prison. Some of them max security prison, and there's a matchmaker who they just talk on the phone. There's all kinds of shows that are wonderful, and I'm going to start breaking them down. Can't wait to do that. Regular cable or all streaming? I basically am one of those idiots that probably has everything bundled from a couple sites. Yeah. I think I pay for multiple apps in multiple places. At yeah, this point. I'm the same way, but like I can't imagine not having cable. I don't really watch many of those channels that you're talking about, like TLC, Discovery. They're just all sitting there. I watch like the movie channels, network stations for sports and whatnot. And that's like it. I have so many channels that I never touch, but I can't imagine ever giving them up. Yeah, I have YouTube TV and then ESPN Plus, Disney Plus, Hulu. I have all of them. And I think like one of them comes in a bundle, but I just don't know where to cancel it or which one is under what email address because I use three email address, which I want. I'm sick of that shit, too. I, we should go back to a society where you only have one. I only have one cell phone. Why do I need... Five different emails from different places. I don't want that shit. What do you I have, mean? Even at, even at work, I have Chaps oh. at Barstool Sports. I have McNeely at Barstool Sports. I have Chaps. And, I'm giving out all my fucking emails. Yeah, Justin. have no one email them. Or maybe do. <laughs> I, I don't know. Chaps McNeely at gmail.com. I got Matthew Cothran at gmail.com. I got Cothran124 at gmail. I got. Bro, I everything. think you're the anomaly. I don't think most people have this many email addresses. I don't even know the passwords for a lot of them, honest to God. I think people uh, but, probably have a personal and a work, and that's it. I think you're the anomaly. Kate, I don't think Kate's looked at her email in like two years. Right? No, no shot. No, I really, I swear to God, I have not. If I you know. you tried to reach me, mm-mm. We'll get like group emails that all of us have to do, and I know immediately I have to text Kate and let her know. Oh, <laughs> like, I have- 
my personal email, I have family members like desperately trying to reach me on there. And I'm like, sorry. What are we looking you. at right now, Kate? Grab your phone. What are we looking at right oh now God. as far as... Oh, I, I have nearly 20,000 emails, I think, between three... Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> I mean text. Where are we at on text? Because I think a lot of people have that. I have like... Yeah. Some, I have crazy numbers for unread emails, too. I remember when I got up to like 890-something, my Aunt Peggy made me go down to her beach house, and she sat me down, poured me a Bloody Mary, and was like, you're not getting up from this table until you respond to your fellow relatives and you start opening these texts. And Heck yeah, Aunt Peg. She's, she's like, you're not leaving this room until it's under 50. And, <laughs> her, and yeah, like they had like an intervention for me. They're like, you need to get Yeah, but that kind of makes thing. it worse. And then it goes back because you answer all those texts yep. and then there's going to be multiple texts from those people. Oh, great to hear from you, Kate. How's it's work so weird. going? How's cash? I mean, if you're a psychologist out there, tell me what that is. It's an anxiety thing. I build them up and then I get afraid to check them even though I know it's nothing bad and then it gets worse and worse and worse and then i'm like oh i better start a new life yeah that's not yeah. unique to you a lot of people are like that i don't yeah, weird. i couldn't live that life but it's not okay it has, definitely has like object permanence where if it's not in front of her face she's not thinking about it 100 like, percent. if i don't look at my phone it doesn't exist Ignorance i, I used to do that with my bank account big time when i was <laughs> very poor like ah well if I need to go to the grocery store, I'll just figure out if it if there's not enough money <laughs> yeah. in there. I don't I don't want to know. Like I yeah. want to think that I'm not completely poor, but I have like nine dollars, so I yeah. am completely poor. Uh, yeah, would you right. rather know you have nine dollars or go to the grocery store and feed yourself? Oh, I'm hoping that the overdraw kicks in. Yeah. Like that, honest to God, I used to do that when I was a single dad and money was really really tight. I used to try to keep. And make sure that if I was getting very close to having no money in my checking account, I would leave like four or five dollars and prepay at the bump at the pump so I could fill it up and overdraft by like 30 bucks. That's all right. Sneaky. That's 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 one approach to managing one's finances. Yep. All right. Sound the retreat.